Today in Belarus, the starting guns for 10 days of joint Russian-Belarusian military exercises. Vladimir Putin has moved tens of thousands of troops into neighboring Belarus for the drills. With over 100,000 Russian troops now positioned close to the Ukrainian border and the capital of Ukraine just over 100 miles from Belarus, if you live in Kiev, these war games feel anything but recreational. The exercises are called Operation Allied Resolve. In Moscow, the Foreign Secretary met with her Russian counterpart for Operation Antagonistic Lavrov. How did their meeting go? Badly. Very badly. The chemistry between the two was acidic. <coughs> Lavrov has roasted foreign ministers like this before. Liz Truss stood her ground. Well, first of all, uh, I certainly wasn't mute in our discussions earlier. I put forward the UK's point of view on the current situation. And on the subject of the Minsk agreements, Russia needs to fully implement the ceasefire. And it needs to remove the heavy weaponry from the region. That has to happen so that we can make progress on the Minsk agreements. Sometimes the big ticket diplomatic event of the day, though, is not the most important. Senior diplomats from Russia, Ukraine, France and Germany met in Berlin today to try to revive the so-called Minsk agreements. Minsk II was the ceasefire framework put in place in 2015, which drastically reduced fighting between Russian separatists and Ukrainian forces in the southeast of the country. The ceasefire itself, which never completely took hold, was supposed to be the start of a process that stalled. The idea, once the fighting stopped completely, the disputed area of Donbass could be granted a degree of autonomy. No prizes for guessing, though, the only signatory of Minsk II still in power. It's unclear whether some sort of accelerated Minsk agreement would be enough for Russia to pull back troops amassed on the Ukrainian border today. Also, the idea of a semi-autonomous Donbass with any sort of veto on Ukrainian foreign policy, for example, is a red line for Kiev. If you want to find the solution from Minsk agreement, you can do this. But Putin doesn't want to find a solution. He wants to use Minsk as an anchor in the, you know, like a harpoon in the body of Ukraine, just to control Ukraine through this, through this region of Donbass, which is now controlled by him. Russian coercive diplomacy, if that's what it turns out to be, was also on display on the Black Sea today. Six Russian warships arrived near the Crimean Peninsula to take part in what the Russians are again calling naval drills. The Prime Minister ended a day of meetings in Poland with British troops. Another display of resolve, elbow to elbow. In London, the legal framework of a new set of sanctions was laid out in Parliament, which would be directed at Russian individuals and businesses in the event of an invasion. Well, a short time ago, before the resignation of Cressida Dick, I should say, I spoke to the Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, and I began by asking him if he supports these sanctions that have just been laid in Parliament against Russia. We support, of course, the sanctions regime. The, the devil will be in the detail of those sanctions. Uh, and to make sure that there's no backsliding on dealing with the plutocrats and kleptocrats that are close to Vladimir Putin. Of course, the Biden administration has ex expressed concern uh, about that in London, and we want to make sure that the government are taking that very seriously indeed. So I shall be scrutinising those proposals in detail over the coming 
um, days. We've, I'm afraid they only arrived in Parliament 20 minutes ago and we're now in recess. So the ability for Parliament to properly scrutinise those proposals uh, has been taken away from us. It was a remarkably sort of frosty press conference between Lavrov and Liz Truss. Uh, he, he, he is extraordinarily dismissive of her. What do you make of the way he treated her? Of course, our relations with Russia are frosty. They have been since they uh, poisoned people in our country in Salisbury. This is part of their game uh, to divide Europe, to be nicer to some allies and frostier to others. So, we saw Keir Starmer addressing NATO. Now, there will be a lot of Labour supporters from the previous Labour leadership who will be very uncomfortable with this. Are you deliberately sending a message about where Labour is now when it comes to international security? It was the Labour Party under Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevin that took us in to NATO. NATO established to maintain peace as a defensive alliance after the Second World War, and I think it's done its job incredibly uh, in those years since the Second World War, and it's a proud Labour achievement. Um, uh, the way to get peace is through that alliance. Um, uh, it's not through playing into the hands of Russia, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, which is there really to divide. Uh, this, you know, in the end, Vladimir Putin has behaved as a despot. Uh, he's been terrible around minority rights in his own country, terrible about round opposition. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's barely a democracy, of course, that country. Who do you want to ally with? Uh, I'm really clear. I think the Labour movement is really clear uh, who we've got to support at this time. And we support a sovereign country that's being threatened by its aggressive large neighbour. So now is not the time to be losing a prime minister, is it? <sighs> he should have gone months ago... Uh, uh, Christian, uh, you know, I've said that time and time again. Um, uh, you know, the British troops are moving into Poland. You know, we could have sanctions brought in within days if Russia does make a move on Ukraine. You know, that's not a time to be Prime Minister, let, is it? Let, let, let me say this, that I'm privileged to be a member of the Privy Council. Uh, I've had very good briefings from officials in the Ministry of Defence, officials in our Foreign Office our intelligence services, uh, those who are on the day-to-day -day of this are doing a, for, a formidable and incredible job, and I pay tribute uh, to them. We have been let down by Boris uh, Johnson, and I think he should go, and that's the position uh, of my party and a, a wealth of people uh, across the country. Well, while you're with us, I mean, you were obviously brought in to you know, what some people say were the consequences of Boris Johnson's words, when we saw you walking with Keir Starmer, surrounded by that mob um, outside Parliament. Um, but how did that feel, and do you blame Boris Johnson for that? Look, it was threatening, it was intimidating, it was nasty. They were shouting um, words and expletives and jeering and behaving in a way that I think is... Uh, deeply concerning. Uh, and they were saying things that Boris Johnson had used at the dispatch box around Jimmy Savile. Uh, and I've got to say, Boris Johnson at that moment was reaching into the dark web, um, far right corners of the web, and plucking out horrible conspiracy stories. The only other person I've seen in modern times behave in that fashion is Donald Trump. You saw where it led to uh, with the mob that tried to sack Capitol Hill. We saw that kind of behaviour in our streets in London. And that's why I'm afraid we have a populist leader who's deeply, deeply dangerous. Did you feel your personal safety was, a, was under threat in those moments? It was a threatening situation. It was. It's not a situation I want any other politician to be in, and, and clearly we've got to take these things seriously in an age in which elected um, uh, representatives uh, have lost their lives, frankly, doing their job.